My name is Bernie Lucht. I'm a distinguished visiting professor at the RTA School of Media. If you don't know anything about my background, I'll say one thing. I worked for the CBC for almost 50 years, most of those years on a radio program called Ideas. Uh, welcome to this panel. Is it time for journalists to abandon the ideal of neutrality? Um, this uh, session is co-sponsored by the RTA School of Media and the Center for Free Expression at Ryerson. And you can tweet about what's going on here using hashtag, there it is somewhere, Jern Oh, the Ryerson Journalism Research Center. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hashtag journalist neutrality question mark. So let's get into it. Traditionally, journalists have been expected to be neutral, nonpartisan, and dispassionate in relation to the stories they cover. But is this possible? Does it even serve the public interest? And is it time to abandon this approach? I want to say a few words about how this panel came to be. Partly, it came out of a discussion that Jim Turk over here and I had before Christmas. I was telling him about restrictions in my private life outside working order, hours as a CBC employee. As a matter of both corporate and journalistic policy, I could not do anything in my personal life that might compromise the CBC's independence and impartiality. For example, I couldn't take positions on any controversial issues. No letters to the editor. Uh, no signing of petitions. There were restrictions on political activities. I couldn't run for political office, publicly support a candidate or political party, attend partisan political events, or contribute money to a political party. If I had made contributions to a political party and were it to become public knowledge, I could, in the words of CBC corporate policy 2.2.17, have a negative, a potential negative impact on CBC Radio Canada's impartiality, independence, and credibility. The lights have just gone up. Can they go back on? Thank you. Um, these restrictions, among others, are limitations on the charter right to freedom of expression. But they were also limitations that I happily accepted to protect my personal credibility as a journalist, the credibility and reputation of my employer, and my desire to keep doing work at the CBC that I loved. It was a trade-off, I thought, because it is both a great privilege and a great responsibility to be a journalist in this society. Besides, my astrological sign is Libra. The symbol of Libra is the scales. Libras like to be on an even keel. We like to be objective and be balanced. So the requirements, the restrictions, personally, didn't grate on me temperamentally. That being said, as you hear today, there is some controversy about the issue in a world where the boundary between our work lives and our personal lives has become increasingly blurred. So that's a little bit of the background from which I come to today's panel. The question we'll be addressing again is, is it time for journalists to abandon the ideal of neutrality? I will introduce each of our speakers in more detail when they come to speak, but I'll just say a brief word about each of them right now. Right to my right here is Jim Turk. He's Distinguished Visiting Professor at, the Ryerson, at Ryerson University and Director of Ryerson Center for Free Expression. Sitting next to Jim is Leanne Goodman. She's a graduate of Ryerson University's journalism program and a journalist who's held a multitude of positions at the Canadian press for almost 30 years. And to the far right, Ivor Shapiro, He's chair of Ryerson University's School of Journalism and a researcher on aspects of ethics and excellence in journalism. Each panelist will have up to 10 minutes to make an opening statement. 
then we'll have a discussion and we'll blend that into questions from the audience. We'll take about 90 minutes for the whole thing, depending on how it goes. So now we come to the question. Is it time for journalists to abandon the ideal of neutrality? And we'll start with Jim Turk. Jim Turk is Distinguished Visiting Professor at Ryerson University and, as I said, Director of Ryerson's Center for Free Expression. From 1988 to June 2014, he served as Executive Director of the Canadian Association of University Teachers. Prior to joining CAUT, Jim was Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Toronto, specializing in Canadian studies and Director of the Labor Studies Program at University College. He has also held several senior staff posts in the Canadian trade union movement. Jim has written extensively about post-secondary education, academic freedom, university governance, civil liberties, commercialization of universities, and related public policy issues. I actually wrote public police issues. <laughs> His most recent book, is a collected edition, Academic Freedom in Conflict, The Struggle Over Speech Rights in University, published in 2014. I'll turn it over to you, Jim. Jim Turk. Thank you, Bruno. Don't start the clock for one minute, Bernie. Uh, I won't start the clock. No, I'll, I'll, okay. Oh, no, wait till I just finish these opening remarks. Bernie is a very self-effacing fellow. He described himself as having worked at the CBC for 50 years and um, much of that uh, with uh, CBC's ideas. I, I don't know if any of you listen to CBC ideas. I hope you do. Uh, he was the executive producer of that program for 28 years and has one of the most distinguished careers in the CBC, and it's really honored to have him with us today. Uh, one of the problems of having an executive producer from radio is, unlike academics, they're strict about time. Um, you know, if you go into a radio studio, you'll see, if you look in over there, you'll see they have big clocks and everything is to the second. Uh, and we have a very loose notion of time. And so he informed me that he's not, not only do we have 10 minutes, but that an alarm is going to go off at the, the end of the 10 minutes, which is why I ask him not to start until I finish uh, this comment. All right, you can start, and uh, <laughs> I'll do my best. Do you want to give me the pen that's over there to your left? I left it there. Yes, I'll be happy to. Thank you. So I'm going to argue it's time for journalists to abandon the ideal of neutrality. Um, I came to have an interest in this subject as a result of some events last, uh, last fall. Uh, one of them was this headline uh, about CNN uh, suspending a very senior reporter for a tweet that was critical of what the U.S. Uh, House of Representatives had just passed. Uh, the journalist is, as I say, quite a uh, well-known uh, journalist in the United States. Uh, she's CNN's uh, global affairs correspondent. Uh, she's been covering stories for CNN since 2000, and before that she worked for ABC News and Agence France Presse. Uh, she holds elected position in a number of journalist organizations, graduated from the University of Wisconsin and the New School for Social Research. Um, what upset her was actions that were taken on November 19th in the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, this is uh, just a quick report on the story from uh, USA Today, saying that the House had passed a bill to halt the admission of Syrian refugees into the United States until they undergo a more stringent vetting process. And as they note correctly, the strictest ever required for people fleeing a war-torn nation. The vetting process was so strict that arguably no one would qualify because it required that the head of, the secretary, the cabinet member, head of Homeland Security, the director of the FBI, and the National Intelligence Director each had to personally certify that each Iraqi or Syrian refugee was safe to admit to the United States before they could be admitted. So she was troubled by that and issued this tweet. 
House passes bill that could limit Syrian refugees. Statue of Liberty bows head in anguish. And as you'll notice, it was retweeted 5,227 times. I don't know how many of your tweets have been retweeted that often. I certainly haven't had that pleasure. And it was liked by 7,382 uh, 7, people. Uh, there was a media controversy about this, and about eight hours later, she tweeted, everyone, I was wrong. It was wrong of me to editorialize. My tweet was inappropriate and disrespectful. I sincerely apologize. That said, CNN felt that her behavior was unacceptable and suspended her for two weeks. Now, the same issue came up in Canada. Um, I do a lot of work with the Canadian Journalists for Free Expression, which is a really important organization defending uh, journalists' rights, uh, both in Canada and internationally, and played a really central role in helping get Mohamed Fahmy out of prison and back to Canada. Uh, the CJFE, um, in July of last year, joined the Canadian Civil Liberties Association in launching a charter challenge to Bill C-51, a very controversial piece of legislation. It's called Canada's Anti-Terrorism Act 2015, and arguably is a serious threat to uh, civil liberties and to freedom of expression in Canada. And they were quite troubled by that. They saw it was their mandate and joined the Canadian Civil Liberties Association in filing this. This posed a problem for three members of the board of the CJFE, all quite distinguished journalists. One, Michelle Shepard, the national security reporter uh, for the Toronto Star. A second, Anna Maria Tremonti, the host of CBC's The Current. And the third, Carol Off, the host of CBC's As It Happens. All three were members of the board, and all three felt they had to resign from the board because they could not be on the board of an organization that was taking this kind of political position. <clears throat> um, Kathy English, the public editor of the Toronto Star, wrote an article about this which raises some of these issues that uh, Michelle faced, and the second of the uh, URLs under Michelle's name would uh, link you to that story. Now, the, the rules that uh, clearly would have forced them to resign or discipline for them for not resigning, had they chosen not to resign, and that applied to um, uh, Elise Labatt, uh, are pretty, are pretty uh, straightforward, and I, this is not moving. Hmm. Let's try this this way. Sorry, we skipped here. We've been having problems with the uh, technology here, and uh, Can we stop the time? yes, please, because <laughs> they can see nothing on their screen, and uh, I may need to give me one second here. I'm sorry, Bernie. Um, this shuts down. This uh, timer shuts down from time to time. And I apologize for that, and I'll try to fix it quickly. Okay, now let's go. The joys of using PowerPoint, right? In the old days, I had just given a talk. <laughs> And uh, now it's not working at all. Oh, there it is. Now we just skip. Let's see if we can skip to where we are, which we can't. I really apologize, folks. All right. Sorry, one of the possibility here. So anybody, uh, Ivor or Leanne, any of you can do a dance routine or something to entertain folks? Well, You're much more entertaining. Yeah, well, this isn't too entertaining because uh, why this is happening is beyond me. Let's see if this will show. Are there any technology people in the room who can explain why it shows when I don't have it on. Now I have a message, we're sorry, something went wrong with the PowerPoint 
It's unstable. Please save your presentation and restart PowerPoint. Okay. Let's do that. I'm... Yeah, <laughs> except they're not working. So I'm just going to close PowerPoint and reopen it and see if that does it. So we're showing, good. And, uh, all right. So the, I was about to describe, you can start the timer again. Okay. Did he do that just by looking at I think so, look. In the old days, we have called it an act of God. Now it's just a mystery of computers. The CNN policy um, by which uh, uh, Elise was, was um, uh, suspended was if you publicly declare your preference for issues or candidates or one side or the other of a public policy is, uh, public, on public policy issues CNN reports on, then your ability to be viewed as objective is compromised. And CNN is owned by Time Warner, which will become relevant at the end of my talk. The CBC policy is ever so much more complex, like everything else at CBC. I looked forever and went through policies and sub-policies, so I just picked out three. Uh, this is their policy on conflict of interest. The expression of personal opinions on controversial subjects or politics can undermine the credibility of CBC journalism and erode the trust of our audience. Employees may not take a stand on public controversy if CBC's integrity would be compromised, acting at all times with integrity and in a manner that will bear the closest public scrutiny, an obligation that may not be fully satisfied by simply acting within the law, whatever that means. Um, now, I want to argue this approach is wrong. It fails to distinguish between an institution's business interests from the profession's public obligations. It confuses material conflict of interest with intellectual interests. It fails to recognize that work should be judged exclusively on its professional quality. It's based on a myth that it's possible to be disinterested, neutral, dispassionate with regard to the issues that are at the center of one's work, or alternately and worse, it recognizes that this, is a, this myth is not true, but demands one act as if it were. So, as Bernie mentioned, I spent 16 years as the executive director of the Canadian Association of University Teachers. These issues applied in the, were big debates in the university. If you're a professor of political science or of economics or whatever, you have an obligation to present the material in, a, in an accurate and comprehensive and fair manner. Um, you know, like journalism, the university is accorded a special role and has public responsibilities. Like journalism, the academic world historically got these issues wrong. Unlike journalism, the university has changed its understanding. In fact, it changed it 100 years ago. The university's interests as a corporate entity are distinguished from the academic profession's obligations to the public, with the latter to trump the former when they conflict. And interestingly, the Canadian Association of Journalists has a provision that journalists have an obligation if they're being put in an unprofessional position by their employer to uh, uphold the uh, traditions of the profession. The conflict of interest is focused in the uh, conflict of interest in the university is understood to focus on material interests, not intellectual. The standard of evaluation of work is professional quality, not the individual's orientation, biases, or reputation. It is recognized that interest, passion, engagement are inevitable and must be recognized, not denied. So I want to tell you a quick story about a guy named Barrett who taught at the University of Wisconsin and was a member, was found out he was a member of a group called Scholars for 9-11 Truth, a group that questioned the common understanding of who was behind the events of 9-11. Critics said, well, this disqualifies him from teaching his course on Islam, religion, and culture. The university's provost argued the important thing is to assure a diversity of views in the classroom and was reassured when Barrett promised to surround 
uh, his unconventional ideas with personal opinion and personal opinions with readings representing a variety of viewpoints. Now, this case was commented by one of the leading experts in academic freedom, a person I disagree with often, named Stanley Fish, who's a very eminent professor of law at a university in Florida, who talks about this case. And he says, the question the province should put to Mr. Barrett is not, do you hold these views? He can hold any views he likes. Do, or do you proclaim them in public? He has, a, he has that right no less than the rest of us. Or even, do you surround them with the views of others? Uh, do you get, as they say in journalism, balance? Rather, the question is, do you separate yourself from your partisan identity and teach the subject matter, whatever it is, regardless, uh, I'm sorry, rather than urge public action, political action? If the answer is yes, allow Mr. Barrett to remain in the classroom as warranted. If the answer is no, he should be shown the door. Not because he would be teaching the wrong things, but because he would have abandoned teaching for indoctrination. The, I also want to draw your attention to an outfit called the American Press Institute. It has a wonderful website with a lot of interesting discussion of these issues. And I'm going to be another minute. I'm, I'm going to be like uh, those uh, Democratic and Republican uh, debaters. I won't be more than a minute. Uh, and they have a section called The Lost Meaning of Objectivity. One of the great confusions about journalism, wrote Bill Kovach and, and Tom Rosenthal in The Elements of Journalism, is the concept of objectivity. When the concept originally involved, it was not meant to imply that journalists were free of bias. Quite the contrary. The term began to appear as part of journalism after the turn of the 20th century, particularly in the 1920s, out of a growing recognition that journalists were full of bias, often unconsciously. Objectivity called for, a journalist, for journalists to develop a consistent method of testing information, a transparent approach to evidence, precisely so that personal and cultural biases would not undermine the accuracy of their work. Or as they say as an, in an aphorism to summarize this, the method is objective, not the journalist. And this is where the similarity to the university uh, is quite clear. In universities, we judge not whether professors have views, crazy or otherwise, which they do, and have a right to, and have a right to express them, but whether in the classroom they follow, and in their research, follow a, a, a method that assures accuracy uh, and uh, fairness. Uh, and going back in conclusion to Time Warner that owns CNN, it actually recognizes this, although it doesn't say it. And in this quote on journalistic integrity where it ends, we expect our reporters, producers, and writers to be fair and honest and to confirm the facts before online articles or TV segments are released to the public. That's the issue. And that should be the only standard on which journalists like academics are judged. Thank you very much. And thank you for your kind uh, extension of my time. I'm going to have to give them two more minutes. Yes. Give them three, to be fair. <laughs> okay. Um. Okay. Next speaker is Leanne Goodman. Leanne is a graduate of Ryerson University's journalism program, and she worked for Canadian. She works for Canadian Press, or has worked for Canadian I've been Press there forever. for almost thirty years. She's been Queens Park correspondent, lifestyles and entertainment editor and Ontario Bureau Chief. She spent more than five years in Washington, D.C. as CP's White House correspondent during the first years of Barack Obama's presidency. And from there, she went to Ottawa to become a head of the uh, Ottawa Bureau. You were head of the Ottawa Bureau, right? No, I was a reporter in Ottawa. You were a reporter yes. in the Ottawa Bureau. Sorry. She was part of the, news, uh, the team that won a national newspaper award for its coverage of the Parliament Hill shooting. She's now senior editor and lives in Toronto. Hello, everyone. Okay, I'm going to be fast. I'm going to talk fast. No, you got two more minutes. You got three more minutes. Where the, where the uh, I'm interested in what you said because I think there's a distinction to be made between tweets and news stories. And I think, unfortunately, I actually believe that news organizations have gone too far. They're crazily concerned about tweets when they shouldn't be. 
uh, just because you tweet out a, a tweet of dismay about Rob Ford or Donald Tr Trump does not mean you can't write an unbiased news story about those people. So I wish media organizations would chill out on the Twitter paranoia. <laughs> but having said that, my answer is no. I do not believe that we can you know, abandon the notion of neutrality and objectivity. And I, I say this by stating outright that I, I believe it's a myth. Journalists are people like everybody else. We, we, we have biases. We have... We have children, and a new story involving terrible abuse of young children uh, emerges. We're going to react in shock and horror like anyone else. We have our own personal biases. We go through life with our own experiences, and so of course we're not biased. But I do agree heartily, or sorry, unbiased. I agree absolutely that the method must be objective, and at CP that's something we really strive every day to uphold. Um, we expect our journalists to be neutral and unbiased in whatever they do and whatever they write. Um, I know all of the reporters that I work with, that I've worked for, that I currently manage, um, are very diligent about including both sides, about using dispassionate language, about not allowing their own opinions to migrate into their copy. And I also find that social media has contributed to this a bit. We're such, there's such a lynch mob now uh, that people will come after you and right away as soon as your story ends up on a website somewhere and accuse you of bias that I sometimes feel that the profession is going too far the other way I and mean, it's leading to this, this whole false equivalency thing which, which worries me more to be honest where we're, we're, um, we're committed, so committed to the two sides notion of a story that it sometimes it's silly, and I'd like to talk about that today. And if you guys want to talk about it further afterwards, but I can give you a couple of ex examples from my own time covering the Obama White House. Um, I was even once told by a Romney strategist that if you just keep repeating a story that isn't true often enough, people will start believing it. And you saw this happen with Obama a lot. People actually started to believe that he was born in Kenya. Uh, Sarah Palin managed to convince people that there were death panels in Obamacare and that this panel of doctors were deciding whether granny or grandpa, when they were going to die and when they were going to put them to death. It was absolute pardon my language, complete bullshit stories that started getting reported as though they were actual stories because Obama would get asked or the White House press secretary would get asked about these stories as though they were real things. And I, that used to drive me crazy. And I think as a profession, we're not doing enough to point out plainly at the very top of a story if it becomes some sort of social media thing that actually this story isn't true. We didn't get the other side of the story because there is no other side of the story. <laughs> there's, there's a sometimes there's a he said she said tendency on every single story. You see it with climate change as well and creationism, where there actually is no other side of the story. And I, I wish I could see us state that more plainly in copy. That you know, oh and by the way, uh, there are no death panels in Obamacare. Never have been. Never will be. <laughs> and so this story is kind of bullshit. Um, pardon my language. I can't help but swear. Um, no, no, nobody swears at a journalism <laughs> um, And you know, I, the Ottawa Press Gallery always got accused of hating the Harper government, and I was part of that press gallery for two years. And I can say with some confidence that, yes, we were probably happy to see Stephen Harper's backside, but I can also say with equal confidence that that was largely due to the way they handled the media. It wasn't about ideology. The, that government made it really difficult to do your job. I, I covered, I was with Harper on various road trips, including one in China where we were given more access to the communist leaders of China on that trip than we were to Stephen Harper. Mm -hmm. And if the Trudeau government starts doing that, the reaction is going to be the same. The Wynn government is now sort of in the hot, on the hot seat a lot. The journalists are sort of getting fed up with the Wynn government because they're seeing some of these tactics that they don't like. We like a good story. <laughs> and power corrupts. And oftentimes, you know, it doesn't matter who, what party affiliation the government is. The government makes the laws. They do the things that affect people's lives. So they're the we're obviously going to cover governments more closely than opposition parties. Um, so whoever's in power is going to end up on the hot seat, and power does tend to corrupt, and we're going to sniff those stories out because we like good stories, uh, we like human failures, <laughs> and those are the stories that we cover, and it really has nothing to do with whether they're conservative, liberal, or NDP. I covered the Bob Ray government, which was rife with all sorts of scandals and controversy, 
and yet, you know, I guess at that point we were being accused of being an anti, a right-wing mob, where now we're being accused of being a left-wing mob. I, I personally have been called everything from an Obama, Obama hater and an Obama lover on the same story. <laughs> so you can't win, and I think sometimes news organizations are too paranoid about the social media reaction, and we should just calm down a bit about it. Um, you know, and it's fortuitous that we're having this discussion as the John Gomeshi trial is playing out a few blocks away. Um, court proceedings can be particularly dangerous place for a journalist's bias to be revealed, and this is why I, I, I uphold this notion that yes, of course, you have to make, you strive always to be neutral and unbiased in your copy. Um, you know, th th those are the sorts of things that can cause mistrials. <laughs> so, um, but I can tell you that among the women in my newsroom and in my home and in my social and professional, professional spheres, I've yet to talk to one who doesn't believe those allegations. Um, they've resonated with women. Everybody knows somebody who's been in a certain situation in which they had to debate whether to come forward or not, and then have argued, have seen what's gone on at this trial and thought to themselves, well, I guess that's not why I'll ever come forward. Um, they can relate to the reluctance to come forward. They've cringed to watch what's happened to the witnesses who have come forward. But, you know, I've got a woman covering that trial. <laughs> And uh, she probably has gone into it with her own personal experiences and personal biases, but she's played it completely straight. Um, there's been no admits or claims or any kind of lo loaded language that can often creep into court copy that you have to be careful about. Um, she's been meticulous about including both sides. She's been very skilled at pointing out inconsistencies in both Gomeshi's defense and the accuser's allegations. It's been even-handed, cool, neutral coverage, and that's what we always have to strive for. Because a you know a, a tweet saying suggesting that Rob Ford is a buffoon is one thing, but you couldn't you can't write a story about Rob Ford being a buffoon. Well, maybe you can now, but <laughs> <laughs> it, you know in the midst of the whole thing coming apart, you can't. Uh, it doesn't. A, a, a snarky tweet has nothing to do with journalism, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and as an aside, I have trouble understanding how any news organization can have columnists re reporting on trials like Gomeshi, because columnists are paid to state their opinion and they're expected to come out with, to state their biases and opinions plainly. And as a reader, how can I read a screed against one witness under someone's headshot one day and then read that person's news reports on the trial and believe it to be objective? Like you, 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 that columnist has staked her reputation on crapping on a witness or crapping on the crown or whatever it is or stating perhaps what's an unpopular opinion. And so then I'm supposed to read the <laughs> news coverage as though it's not coming at it from a certain bias. Um, to me, that's a trend in journalism. I know why it's happening. Newsrooms are short staffed. They don't have a lot of bodies anymore. And so they figure, well, I'll get one person to do two jobs. But that's a situation in which I think it's a disturbing and fundamentally bad trend uh, that I, I will confess I have a bias against that trend. Um, I worked at a paper once actually for a brief time. I was at CP for most of the last 30 years, but I was briefly at the Toronto Sun. And um, I, the, the columnists there often resulted in the reporters getting blacklisted, like the, the like, uh, community advocacy groups wouldn't call us back uh, because they were mad about a Christy Blatchford column, let's say. So it can affect how you do your jobs. Uh, and it can cause people to think that reporters, news reporters are unbiased just the way that the, or, or have a bias the way the columnist does, which can really drive all of the reporters I know completely crazy. Um, so we got a lot to discuss here today. I'm particularly interested in the false equivalence, equil, equivalency thing that I've really seen has just gone crazy in the, with the explosion of social media. I honestly think news organizations are so terrified that they're getting accused of bias, like in real time, like right as soon as the story hits the wire, that they're going too far the other way. And I would like, the trend I would like to see is not so much uh, admitting that journalists have biases and not expecting them to be neutral, but stating plainly in stories that are, are completely trumped up, pardon the pun, that uh, in fact that's not the case and that isn't what's going on and there's no point to go and get another side to a story that is fundamentally complete bullshit. Um, anyway, that's it for me. I think, did I make it into under my 10 minutes? You've got three minutes to go. Well, let me see. I think I, I think I cut something out. <laughs> <laughs> I might have cut something out.
No, I didn't. I got it all. So I'm okay. in under the wire. That's because I work for Wire Service, and we have to be really fast. <laughs> trying to separate the journalists from the academics. Thank you. Thank you. That's the end. Okay. And I got to add three minutes to you, right? Uh, no. uh, yeah, I've got six. He's both a journalist and an academic. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me just uh, pardon me while I shuffle my papers. I need no introduction to this crowd. Pardon? I need no introduction they, to this crowd. Yes, he needs no introduction to this crowd. But I'll introduce him anyway. Uh, unless you've already read the stuff it says on the faculty outline, on the faculty bio. So Ivor is chair of the School of Journalism, teaches ethics and feature reporting, and conducts research into aspects of ethics and excellence in journalism. He chaired the Ethics Advisory Committee of the Canadian Association of Journalism Journalists until June 2015, and was the founding chair of the Canadian Journalism Project, a national website providing information, commentary, and resources related to the achievement of and challenges to journalistic ethics, journalistic e excellence. Ivor was born and raised in South Africa and immigrated to Canada in 1985. He's a former contributing editor to Saturday Night Magazine, a former managing editor of Chatelaine. He's written feature articles for Toronto Life, Walrus, Maclean's, Today's Parent, and the Globe and Mail's report on business. He's been honored six times by the National Magazine Awards, and uh, his magazine writing has been chosen for a number of anthologies, and he's the editor of a book called The Bigger Picture, Elements of Feature Writing, published in 2008. Ivor, I've said enough. <laughs> Thank you. And I have my clock going here. I'm, it's an honor to me to sit, with, uh, sit on a panel with people like uh, Jim and Leanne. It's an honor to see a alumna of the school being um, so smart and so successful as a journalist. Um, it's wonderful. Um, I think words are important, though, and I think words, words have been used so far in this panel that I think bear a few moments to pause over. Um, <laughs> not that one. I'm fine with that one. Um, the... the, um, the words objectivity credibility and indeed neutrality are difficult and in fact I think unhelpful words to use in, the, in, in terms of the matters we're speaking about. In fact, probably pretty much unhelpful, period. What these words have in common is a focus on the beholder, the appearance of objectivity or the experience. Credibility means the experience of the person who gets something as to whether they believe it or not. Uh, neutrality, nobody, no human being is ever neutral about anything. So you cannot be neutral, you can only appear neutral. It seems to me that if we're, and you know, CNN uses these words, CBC uses these words, we use these words, I hear these words far too much from colleagues and students. It seems to me that if we get to, the, get to grips with the topic, we will not be talking about appearances, we will be talking about conduct. So let's try to do that. Um, let's start with some easy cases that seem relevant to what we're doing, what we're talking about here. Um, Leslie Roberts, anchor with Global News, obliged to resign after admitting he was secretly part owner of a public relations firm that arranged for clients to appear on the program he hosted. Like, ouch. CBC reviews the relationships between former business correspondent Amanda Lang and major financial services companies after allegations surface of influencing um, and the allegations are found to be unjustified. She later moved to Bloomberg News, but no one's likely to suggest that allegations like that needed to be reviewed. Of course they did. Easy case. And lots of other easy examples might be adduced that seem to go in this sort of general area of what might carelessly be called neutrality. But let's move on to harder cases. A journalist stands for political office or helps out in an election campaign. That's any citizen's democratic right. But can a journalist do it? A Middle East correspondent who lives in Jerusalem and is an Israeli citizen has a son who is, sorry, whose family includes Canadian, uh, uh, Israeli citizens, has a son who is conscripted into the Israeli army. 
A sports reporter falls in love with a professional athlete in a team that he or she covers daily. Or, yes, a CBC Current Affairs host is actively involved in a nonprofit organization that is suing the federal government. Those are harder cases. Well, how about this one? Here's the Toronto Star's business section, uh, January the 30th. As long as it continues to live, post media is a blight to readers. Not just one page, not one page, yes, cancer uses the word. Post media is worth more dead than alive. Godfrey calls weak loony noose around your neck. Uncertainty for community journalism and so on. Three pages devoted to community, to, to post media basically. Um, five years, no one can credibly argue that post media has been of net benefit to Canada. Um, you know. Uh, yeah. What could the agenda be there? Um, <laughs> for what it's worth, it's not relevant here, but for what it's worth, I happen to agree with almost all of those statements. <laughs> That's not the point. The point is that this is a th triple spread in a business section of the flagship newspaper, profit, flagship property of a media company that, one, competes directly with post media, two, bid for the very newspaper properties. Uh, whose price is now arguably driven down by articles like this, and three, could profit by influencing public opinion and therefore the federal government in its consideration of post media's application to allow more foreign ownership, which is what led to the story. Is this neutrality? Of course it's not neutrality. But... What is at issue here? By the way, we're sitting here in the Toronto Star Center for Reporting, <laughs> um, indicating that I have a dependency as chair of the school. I have a dependency relationship with the Toronto Star Company. So, should I shut up? No. My talk to you today, I, I am free to express my opinions about Toronto Star and Post Media. My talk to you today, you're free to, tell, to decide whether it's bullshit or not. Here's the key point, though. My talk to you today is not a work of journalism. Um, I've argued, you, and, and now you're going to ask me, well, what is a work of journalism? What is journalism? And I've argued in other quarters about what a work of journalism is. Here's the key sentence to me. And it's not a sentence that has... Uh, provoked any apparent controversy among readers in Oceania or North America or Northern Europe. Journalism comprises the activities involved in an independent pursuit of or analysis of accurate information about current or recent events and its original presentation for public edification. Obviously the word independent. Independent discovery and independent analysis of facts as being what makes journalism distinct from other activities of social importance, such as public relations and marketing and so forth. The problem with an attitude of dependency, sorry, a position of dependency, which is the opposite to independence, is that it prevents you from, it, dependency prevents you from trusting in the selection of facts and the selection of sources that underlies your work, which is fine for me, but it's not fine for journalists. Um, because journalism is that definitive thing of independence. So does that mean, of what that does not mean, and this is my first key point, what that does not mean is that I shouldn't express my opinion. It doesn't, if I'm a journalist now, working in journalism, it doesn't mean I shouldn't express my opinion because opinions are not what compromise my independence. What compromise my independence is a relational state, not a mental state. I am dependent on Toronto Star. Guess what? David Olive is dependent on the Toronto Star Camp Corporation. He is. He works for them, right? So he cannot be an independent analyst or commentator on post-media. Just can't be. That's the problem. 
but he can express his opinions, but he cannot be independent. Uh, but, but he must be independent. So my first point is somewhat agreeing with Jim. To be a journalist by no means requires one to give up one's right to express oneself, whether in politics or petitions or any of those other things. But independence in journalism merely requires one to give, one, give up one's relational attachments to the things one is covering. So do I just agree with Jim and stop talking? No. Because once one talks about those big questions that began our conversation, the CBC requiring people to suspend themselves from, uh, from being part of an organization that is suing the federal government, or CNN requiring, sorry, once one, yes, CNN requiring its reporter not to express herself on the uh, position taken by Congress, which she covers. What that brings us to is not the rights and freedoms of the journalists to express their opinions. It brings us into another arena, which is the rights and freedoms of the organizations they work for. It seems to me that if we work for a business, that organization, that business, has a right to strive for business success, to make a brand claim and protect it and deliver it. So here's where I start agreeing a little bit more with Leanne than Jim. If a business has the right to succeed by protecting its brand, then it has a right to expect its employees to help achieve its success by protecting its brand. Now, if you're a news organization, your brand depends on that independence and that perception, and this is where those appearances actually begin to be relevant. Because appearance, a brand is all about appearances. So a, a journalistic organization doesn't merely have the right to expect, in my opinion, a journalist to be independent in that sense of divesting oneself of interest. It has the right to expect its employees, including journalists, to behave in such a manner that protects the appearance of credibility. It seems to me this is simple wisdom at work. Do I have one more minute? Yes, you do. Excellent. This is simple wisdom at work. It's not ethics at all, you see. If I'm a beat reporter, let's say I work for myself, and I'm a beat reporter. I'm running a website covering crime in Toronto. It's not why I am free. I work for myself. I'm free to express my opinion that every cop in Toronto is a racist meathead or that every victim in Toronto of crime is a whiner and malingerer. If that's my opinion, I'm free to express it. In fact, it's helpful if I express it to you as my reader. Is it wise for me to express that opinion? Not really, because guess what? The cops are going to stop talking to me, and the victims are going to stop talking to me, and my website's going to go out of business. It's not, wise, not wrong, but it's also not wise. It seems to me that if that is true for me, if it is unwise, if it is wise for me to watch my mouth, then it is also true for a news organization to watch its mouth. But a news organization's mouth consists of the sum of the mouths of its journalists. And therefore, it seems to me legitimate, CNN or CBC should watch its mouth, watch the mouths of its employees. It's simply wise, and they have a right to be wise. That's my thought. Thank you. Thank you. What I'd like to do is start a conversation going here for a few minutes and then open it up to all of you in the room uh, for some comments and questions and see what the panel responds to. So I think what I'd like to do, Jim, is start with you particularly responding to Ivor's point about the rights and freedoms of organizations. One of the things that struck me in this discussion is that there are many things we agree on, 
but I think there's some slippery uh, use of words that makes it appear as if we agree when we don't, or makes it appear as if we disagree when we do, also don't. Um, I was troubled when Bernie began this talk by saying as an employee of the CBC for 50 years, he couldn't write a letter to the editor. He couldn't work for a political party. He couldn't even attend a political rally. Uh, I think that's a fundamental violation of free expression and civil liberty rights that should every Canadian should have. Um, and I have, I think the slippery part in the last, in, in Ivor's comment was drawing the analogy between him as a journalist who has his own blog or his own whatever, and how it would not be prudent, although he has a right, it would not be prudent for him if he's covering crime to demean the police or demean victims. And then to say, well, since that makes sense for me, that makes sense for the CBC or the Globe and Mail or the Toronto Star. Um, the fact is the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, the CBC take political positions on all sorts of matters. We have things called editorials. Um, and try to distinguish themselves from other... They have columnists who take a variety of, of positions that can be way out there. So the Globe and Mail has everything from Gwyn Morgan uh, arguing pretty right-wing economics to Jim Stanford arguing quite progressive economics. Uh, each of them offends various readers. Margaret Wente, who is one of the best writers in Canada, I cannot read because my blood pressure goes through the ceiling. Uh, or Christy Blatchford. Um, so newspapers are not monolithic organizations that have a brand in the sense that, uh, that Ivor was describing. They, in fact, have a variety. They, they in, in Ivor's description, uh, they anger various parts of their readership all the time. And I'm sure that there are people, advertisers and others, who ask the Toronto Star why they have a column by Rick Salutin. Or I'd ask the Globe why they keep putting on Gwyn Morgan. In other words, I don't think the analogy is the same. Uh, and to allow journal for the CBC to allow its journalists to engage in political activities, to express views, to tweet, um, does not harm the CBC. What harms the CBC, and this comes back to what I think is, I think is the central point, uh, and that is the judgment should be a professional judgment. Is that journalist work? And I don't like the word objective. I mean, I like what it points to, but I think it gets into, us into a lot of trouble. Is that journalist work fair, accurate, rigorous? Are facts checked? Does it stand scrutiny? If it does, I don't care what the journalist does, and I don't think that that media organization has the right to limit that journalist's freedom of expression and civil liberties in the way the CBC limited, limits its employees. The judgment, the only issue for me is a professional standard. If that journalist in his or her work meets a, that professional standard, that we, I think we all agree on what that professional standard should be, that's the end of it. Leanne. If the journalist's work is fair, accurate, and withstand scru scrutiny, should the journalist have more freedom personally to express themselves outside the work context? Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. I, I can tell you, though, I know political reporters, people who've worked for que at Queen's Park for years who won't vote. They're so nervous that, you know, what if it came out that I voted for the NDP? <laughs> I don't know how it ever would, but some people take it to a very extreme degree where they won't even participate in the democratic process for fear of being it, it somehow emerging that they had a bias. Um, you know, it, it's, a, this, it's a tough one to come on one side or the other on. It just depends. You can't, I don't think you can judge it in a blanket way. Like, it, like I said, I would have no problem with the, the, the CNN tweet. I thought that was so innocuous. Like, wh who is she offending there? Like what, both houses, both parties? Or who, who's going to, on a practical matter, how is that going to cause CP, CNN any problems? It wasn't going to hurt her. Mm -hmm. Nobody, people weren't going to stop talking to her. But I do also understand the practical concerns that, yeah, 
people will stop talking to you if they're following you on Twitter and they see that you're constantly slamming them or they think that you have a bias and that they don't feel safe talking to you. I just think it's hard to um, to legislate the matter on a it's a it's a case by case situation, and it depends on how far they're going in their tweets. I mean, what's the practice at CP? Well, I, I should be careful about what I say here. My boss, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> my bosses probably won't. You know, I I think I was at the AP and I felt that their social media policy was too draconian, and I, there are times when I think we we're too nervous about tweets. Um, I've seen people get called on the carpet over tweets that I saw, and it's like, oh, you know, no big deal. Yeah. It's such a fast thing, Twitter, too, right? It's just people having conversations a lot of times, and poof, in 30 seconds, they're forgotten. If you don't see it within a minute, it's gone and down. And so I just, I, I really think that news organizations are too paranoid about Twitter. Having said that, if some one of my reporters was on Twitter calling somebody a liar or really going after somebody hard, I would have some problems because it's going to affect the perception. The optics aren't great and it may actually impact how they do their job if they can't get people to call them back or take them seriously as a uh, neutral reporter. So mm -hmm. I, I judge it on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah. Ira? Yes. You were writing notes. I. <laughs> well, um, I, I mean, these, are th these, these points that both Ian and Jim have made are excellent. Um, I would take issue with Jim on this one. Um, I, first of all, the part of what Jim said that I completely agree with is that what really matters is the standard of performance. So, yes, you know, accuracy, fairness, checked facts, yes, verification. Does it stand scrutiny? I think he puts that extremely well. That's what really matters. However, I don't think you can take from there, uh, go from there reasonably and say, well then, nothing else matters. So uh, the part that I feel is really important about this word independence is w the effect of independence on your ability to do your job. Um, and, th and that is largely an unconscious process. So, um, so you know, well, okay, let, let me come back to that point. I'm just going to make one other point, which I think is important. Jim uses the example of columnists, and he uses the example of columnists to uh, make an inference about reporters. And mostly what we're talking about here are reporters, not columnists. Anna Maria Tremonte, um, Carol Off, we, the taxpayers, pay their salaries not to express their opinions but to delve into information. So um, a, journal, a, a news organization does typically express its opinions in columns and in editorials and so forth, but part of its brand, the Toronto Star's brand does not consist of being a voice, does not consist of being a voice for liberties in Toronto. That is part of its brand, but it does not consist of that brand. What ultimately it says is you can come here and you can get fair and accurate and independent reports. Jim's logic, it seems to me, would, would go here. It would say it doesn't matter if your reporters on the stock market have, uh, have shares in IBM or Apple and might, might, give, might be unconsciously inclined to kind of boost IBM and show and 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 dis Apple because that's they have a lot of money at stake in that. The example I gave of the Middle East reporter at the at the New York Times, uh, Ethan Bronner, his son in the Israeli army, he's the New York's New York Times's Middle East bureau chief. His son's life depends on the security of Israel, right? Is there anything more likely to influence one's subconscious choices than the life? of one's son. So I don't know that that's the point in dispute here. We would all probably, I suspect most of us would agree, no, you can't have shares in the companies that you cover. You shouldn't have an interest, a relational interest in the matters you cover. Point being for me is that Toronto Star's brand, the CBC's brand, CNN's brand, is that its reporters are independent. That's an appearance matter. And that's where I go back to what I said before. You have a right to protect that brand. Okay, I see Jim wanting to get in here. Wow, I am so surprised. <laughs> As always, uh, Ivor is very articulate. Um, 
but in fact misrepresented uh, my position because I agree with him completely. I drew a distinction uh, using the term material interests versus intellectual interests. That is, if you're a shareholder in a company that you're covering, that's different than if you have no shares, no relation, no dependency, but you think it's a terrible company, and you've said that. Those are very different things. And Ivor actually put it far more articulately than I did in his opening remarks, distinguish between a relational dependency and a mental state. So I think we're in agreement that any kind of material, material dependency uh, is a conflict of interest. Uh, so if one receives large amounts of money speaking to the oil industry or to uh, other groups, that can compromise, and does compromise in the example. So we're in agreement on that. Where we're maybe in disagreement is if you have no material dependency, but a point of view and you articulate it, that, in my view, should not disqualify you to be a reporter. And I am talking about reporters, not columnists. When I was talking about columnists, I was using it as a way of saying, Ivor's brand as a blogger on criminal matters is very different than the extremely complex brands of large media organizations that are all over the place when you add together their own editorial positions, the various columnists they have, and so forth. And so to pretend that, a, that journalists, by expressing their views, are going to compromise the brand of the organization when it's a large organization with many employees and taking many different views is, I think, a mistake. Okay. I'm going to move to another topic or so. But if you're thinking of a question, get ready. I'm going to come to you guys in just a couple of minutes. Um, I was... Uh, doing very superficial Google research the other night on trustworthiness in journalism. How are journalists perceived? At Ipsos Reid, I think, does this annually. A 2015 survey said in Canada, journalists are trusted by 18% of respondents. Journalism is put 24th on a list of 34 professions just trusted mar marginally higher than journalists are financial advisors and plumbers. <laughs> trusted marginally less than journalists are television and radio personalities and lawyers. And below them are CEOs and local politicians. So here is my question. As journalists and as scholars, what do you make of this apparently low trust that the public puts in journalists. Well, we're out there. Yeah. We're, our work is out there every day, 24-7. Yeah. It's not perfect. There are mistakes made. Corrections have to be made. I think people get uptight, even about if you've got someone's age wrong. You know, people get uptight about that kind of stuff. Um, but I also think you have to, people consume news with their own biases. Like, people come into it with a bias. So if you've got a story out there about, if, if you're part of Ford Nation and you're reading a story that is about some, I hate to keep coming back to him, <laughs> about some mm -hmm. doofus thing that Rob Ford did, then you're going to believe that that reporter and that news organization has it out for Rob Ford, even if it's untrue. Mm -hmm. As mentioned, I, I wrote a story about Michelle Bachman where I heard, got all this terrible email saying I was a Michelle Bachman lover, you should be ashamed of yourself. And in the same story, you are a Michelle Bachman hater, you terrible, awful woman. Mm -hmm. So people consume news with their own biases as well. And, and we're out there in real time, 24-7, and so obviously our work is up to more scrutiny than maybe the professions that rate higher. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? It's not great, though. I, it, it, it's, it's bothersome, that's for sure. Was first out of it, I um, you know, it's an interesting, uh, the, the statistic is quoted quite a lot. The first thing I would say is journalists shouldn't be trusted. Nobody should be trusted. Part of our mission statement is don't trust us. Trust what you assess to be the facts of the situation based on the evidence that is given. And journalists' job is to provide evidence. Is that part of our mission statement? Uh, yeah, well, Not, don't trust us? Yeah, it should be. <laughs> I think it should be, because part of, what, part, of what, part of the strategic <laughs> rituals that we teach these guys to do is 
verify, attribute, show your evidence. Don't just say, hey, you know, so-and-so so -and -so is true, here's the evidence. I think that is what we do. But, um, you know, it's interesting when you make the comparison with lawyers, because of course, conduct is more important than what we say. When, when people are in trouble or need a contract evaluated or, you know, or uh, have, a, have a messy situation where their wives, husbands, or spouses, they go to lawyers. They may not trust the lawyers, but they pay them very good money to defend their interests, which means that actually they do trust them because they're giving off money and they're ex expecting a duty in exchange. I think the same is true for journalists. The true measure of journalist trust would be are, are the works of journalists actually used and do they form part of the public discourse? And I think the answer is overwhelmingly yes. Yes. Jim. Well, I'd, I'd say two, maybe three things in response to your findings. The first is that obviously the attempt to say we're neutral, unbiased, dispassionate, isn't working. I mean, the justification for all of uh, those restrictions on the civil liberties and freedom of expression of journalists is in order for them to maintain their credibility. It isn't working, would be my first observation. And interestingly, the, those who have a public trust to be fair, accurate, rigorous, subject to uh, evaluation by others are academics who abandon those uh, the position that uh, journalists still hold a hundred years ago, and if you look in the rankings of who's trusted, they're near the top of the list. Secondly, um, it's really important to understand that there are some powerful interests in the society that have a vested interest in demeaning journalists. Because after all, the role of a free press is to be critical, is to question conventional thinking, is to separate bullshit from accurate stuff. And so as far as you do that, you inevitably are your, your reporting, your fair reporting is challenging the rhetoric of a lot of powerful interests. And if you look at how arguably the best newspaper in the United States, the New York Times, is treated in any Republican candidate's debate as this liberal haven of, well, people to the left of Bernie Sanders, were it only true from my point of view, but it isn't. Um, if you look at, anyway, so part of, part of the uh, public's stature, a uh, rating of, of journalists' uh, trustworthiness, I think is also a result of concerted efforts by powerful interests to try to lessen the credibility of journalists because journalists, by and large, and journalism, by and large, does play a vital public role, which is why in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, there are four basic freedoms in Article 2, and one of them is freedom of the press. It serves a vital public interest, and insofar as journalists can be demeaned, it undermines their uh, ability to fulfill that vital public role. Not to get us off the hook entirely, but I do recall the Pew Research Center doing a study on the average news consumer, like the most voracious news consumers, and they do tend to be people who are quite partisan. They're reading and they seek out their, yeah. <laughs> the news outlets that reflect their points of view. So you can see then if, it's, if the most voracious news, reader or, or news consumers are people that are already coming at things with a bias, that's not to excuse us, that's an appallingly low trust rate. But I do know a lot of people who don't, do you know those people in your life? It's like, oh, I don't really follow the news. I don't really know. Oh, well, really? I, is that happening? Oh, what's going on in Syria? Do you know those people? I think they are, that's a you big, know who are those people. They, I, I think those, there's a big portion of the population who's like that too and probably doesn't distrust us because they don't consume us enough to be paying close enough attention. But anyway. Can we turn over to you guys? Yeah. Let's, why don't we start, please. Is there a microphone in the room that you want, does yeah, anybody sure. want, or? Here, we can share one of these, you can take, oh, yeah. Okay, so, so will you be the microphone wrangler or something like that? Yeah, okay, yeah, thanks, Ange. Ange will be the mic wrangler. Can, tell us who you are, please. Uh, uh, hi, I'm April Lindgren, I'm a prof here in the School of Journalism. I'm sorry, yeah. gentlemen, I come down firmly in Leanne's camp on this. 
Um, I, I just think that we don't need to hand people clubs to hit us over the head with uh, in terms of our ability to do our jobs in, um, in a way that builds confidence in the quality of the information. If I go to a pro-choice rally, for instance, as a journalist, I mean, I know I can go to that pro-choice rally and still write a story the next day about, maybe not that rally, but maybe a different one, and that I can do it in a, in a way that is accurately portrays the, per, the perceptions of both sides. But uh, the public doesn't know that. And I think part of it has to do with media literacy. And you know, if they all were, if everybody in the public was absolutely capable of judging that this is a well-reported story, it's verified, it's accurate, um, and it's fair, that would, that would be great. But we actually don't live in that world. And I think that um, uh, putting ourselves in those positions is handing the critics a club that undermine the credibility of, 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 of well-reported and decent work. And I would just also draw the comparison that, you know, this isn't, I don't think, particular to the uh, journalists and the news media. I mean, if you have a Toronto police officer who um, is a card-carrying member of a white supremacist organization, you're going to, there's going to, you're going to raise quest questions about his ability to, uh, to uh, police in a, in a diverse community. Uh, similarly, if your doctor is the president of the Anti-Vaxxer Association of Canada, you also might have some questions about the, the credibility of, of, of that doctor. So I think um, we live in a world where appearance is very much perception, and not paying attention to that as journalists um, undermines our, uh, our, our ability to do our jobs, I would argue. Anybody want to take that up? I, I actually agree with everything April just said. So I, do, I, I, don't, know about the, uh, I don't know about the apology you made, April. <laughs> I actually disagree with about everything April just said. There okay. you go. <laughs> so I think we want to have a... Um, first of all, abandoning your rights to free expression and your basic rights under the Charter in order to protect your appearance, as we just said, isn't working. That is, journalists aren't viewed all that respectably to begin with. Secondly, to draw an analogy to the police or to physicians is to make an totally inappropriate analogy. Police have, are able to exercise the power of the state against individuals. And so if you anger a police officer, you can pay a very heavy price. Journalists have no power of that sort. And therefore, that's one of the differences. And a physician is more like a police officer in the kinds of power they have over us than a journalist. So I think it's a totally false analogy that's misleading. It comes to the heart the issue comes to the heart, can journalists' rights to free expression and exercise their civil liberties, such as writing letters to the editor, participating in political, be justifiably restricted? And I say as long as they've done their job properly, that their work meets professional standards, then they have, there is no right to limit their civil liberties. Yes. Uh, I was just gonna... I, I'm Ann McNeely, I'm a prof here too, and. Um, April raised some social justice issues. I would wonder how you would respond to a social justice issue um, such as the civil rights movement in, say, the 60s, where clearly you wouldn't, would you be giving equal time and space to the KKK as you would to the um, freedom fighters? Well, and it's funny, when you look back at the reporting from, some, from that period, there's a reluctance. I mean, you saw it with same-sex marriage, too, even 10 years ago. There was always getting this other weird other side that is an attack on traditional marriage as though that was, you know, it, 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 it's funny when you look back at the reporting at the time and how it would seem just completely unacceptable to us now knowing what we know and where it went. And that's my point sometimes with some of these, this false equivalency. Like, there's really no other side here. You sh shouldn't be beating on people in the streets. Like, this whole, I, I got in so much trouble for a couple of Trayvon Martin stories that I wrote down there because I thought that whole case was appalling. Like, it didn't, it, I didn't, I, I'm, I'm sure I, I know I did, as a matter of due course, put in Zimmerman's explanation. But, um, these are things I struggle with because there are some my stories where I just don't think there is a false equivalency. There's, there's, what is the other side? The other side is that it's acceptable to beat, a, to shoot a kid in the back who's, because he's wearing a hoodie. Like I don't know. So it's possible. <laughs> Yeah, 
And that is also where a bias can come in. It can be, it can come into, well, who are you choosing to speak to? <laughs> like you can tell me that you've presented me with a story that has a, both sides, you know, all the, that you've connected all the dots, you've talked to all the people that you've, you couldn't find an opposing voice maybe. And I, I will go back at a reporter sometimes and say, look, surely there's somebody who's going to defend, uh, you know, we're working on a story today about how badly the Crown has screwed up the Joveshi case. And I will have to say to the reporter, you've got to find somebody who will defend the Crown in this instance. Like they were, their hands were tied in a lot of things. They couldn't call expert witnesses because for all sorts of complex reasons. They couldn't go after the other charges, like the other allegations because the women wouldn't come forward. So anyway, I, don't, I, went out, I didn't even answer the question, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just went off on a rambling tangent. Jim? Yes, one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, parts that I agree with Leanne in her opening comment was talking about false equivalency. Um, we had a lot of experience in my academic role where I say, well, professors have to, when they're covering a course, have to uh, be balanced and cover all perspectives. I mean, first of all, it's impossible. Secondly, does that mean if you're teaching a course in uh, uh, 20th century, European history, you have to find a Nazi to come in right. and talk in your class. Um, and I mean, if there were one word I would, I think is well-intentioned but really troublesome that I would wish would get out of the journalist uh, uh, lexicon altogether is balance. You have an obligation to be fair and accurate and rigorous. There is no such thing as balance because that's what leads to this false equivalency. So you're covering climate change. You have to root out one of the handful of uh, totally discredited climate change deniers every time you quote uh, a major uh, finding or a group of scientists. I prefer to say that, and some argue that it's all about creationism and that God has created the warming climate. Like, you can't put that in a story. I mean, there's people who but you still get expected think, to. Yeah, there's people who <laughs> still think the moon's made of green cheese. So when you're writing about the Hubble telescope and some pictures, do you have to find a green cheese or to, to quote so you're balanced? Um, so I, I, th I think you get into really difficult problems when that's... It's, does your story stand up to scrutiny as a fair and um, uh, balanced, not balanced, but rigorous? That's the term. Uh, Gentlemen at the back of the room. Hi, I'm Paul Knox. I'm recently retired from this place, um, but um, not capable of uh, being gotten rid of. Um, <laughs> Thank goodness. I wanted to ask about disclosure. Um, you mentioned a couple of uh, um, a couple of types of stories. I've mentioned uh, people writing about stock uh, companies in whose uh, in which they own stock. Um, uh, I would argue that we've seen like a bit of a change, at least in some of our uh, Canadian newspapers. Uh, I know that when I used to work at the Globe and Mail, it was pretty much forbidden uh, to own uh, individual stocks if you worked. Uh, in the report on business, uh, I think they let you own mutual funds. Um, but now you see people not only write about stocks but disclose in the story that they actually hold, own, own those stocks. Whereas I was speaking with somebody who works for the Wall Street Journal uh, the other day who said that they actually go on an annual uh, refresher course about um, that kind of thing and um, they are there are strictly circumscribed in terms of uh, what they can do if they're uh, writing about things that are anywhere near it. Similarly, uh, we never used to see disclosure in travel stories um, that the person um, was, uh, I think the phrase that's usually used is, a guest of whoever they were writing about. Um, however, the place didn't approve the story. Nevertheless, uh, funnily enough, very few, if any, of the stories seem to be negative. So what I'm wondering is uh, whether you folks feel that not only in those types of stories, but also in uh, more um, in the news section, um, disclosure has any role at all. In other words, if you could say, well, uh, you know, I'm doing my best here, guys, but I have to tell you, I am the uh, president of the local Planned Parenthood Federation. I am 
Um, uh, you know, I, 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 I donated to the Liberal Party last, uh, last year and that kind of thing. Um, you know, and if not, why not? Because there would seem to be a logic there. Um, if, you, if it works in one kind of story, maybe it works in another. I know our organization, we won't accept travel pieces that resulted from junkets. Um, I have a feeling some slip through sometimes, though. Or are you hiring, you're getting it from a freelancer, and I don't know, I've suspected that some slip through. But I agree, there should be disclosure. And I personally would, we were talking earlier about conflict of interest, which to me is a separate thing from neutrality. I, I actually don't think that you can, you can or should be writing on a company if you've got an invested interest in that company or any other story for that matter. I wouldn't have an, an anti-choice person covering a pro-life rally probably if, if this person was really vocal and open about it. Um, you're just inviting trouble if you do that. Um, as for disclosure, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure we've ever needed to, but I do see it. You do see it, especially with the advent of online journalism. You're seeing a lot more. You'll see a little disclaimer at the end, usually on columns, saying, you know, this person. I, I saw one on a, a Rebecca Eckler column of some type where at the bottom of the story, not at first, but I guess something got brought to their attention where at the end of it, there was a little note saying, oh, by the way, the person quoted in this story is Rebecca Eckler's, you know, spa massage lady. <laughs> Which I don't think was getting disclosed from the outset, but when it came to the attention of the editors, they were quick to put up a disclaimer. You do see that sometimes, but you don't often see it in the actual print edition of a newspaper. I will grant you that. And maybe you should. Um, well, I, I, I think disclosure, transparency is a remedy for um, conflict of interest. Uh, it is, a, it, 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 transparency combined with relational disattachment would settle all the ethical issues uh, for, for not just me, but I think many people. But, <laughs> Um, again, it's ethics, it's the free, what, what we've been talking again and again and again about is the freedom of the reporter, the individual reporter, versus the freedom of the business to promote its business interests. And to me, it's disingenuous to say that journalists don't have power. No media scholar would say that what is reported in the media does not have power. Everything about elections, everything about whether we go to war or don't go to war is based on somebody getting an idea somewhere. And if some media organizations, not all do, not all do, let's look, can I spell Fox? Not all media organizations have it as part of their brand that they're actually going to be, be providers of independent information. If that's true, then, it's, then I don't hear any arguments that tell me why that business doesn't have the right to take reasonable measures to protect that brand. And it is about appearance. It's about business sense. The joy of being on a panel with Leanne and, and Ivor is when you're preparing to answer one question, there's really important things raised. In answer to Paul's uh, uh, question, um, my experience with conflict of interest was primarily in my role uh, at the Canadian Association of University Teachers. It came up especially with regard to the pharmaceutical industry, which spends an enormous amount. It spends an average of $60,000 per physician uh, in trying to uh, give goodies or invite to conferences or other things and gives lots of money for research. And there's been a big concern about it. There's been a lot of academic research that's shown that the results of rigorous clinical trials as to whether a drug is good or not are directly related to who funded it. That 70%, between 60 and 70% of the clinical trials funded by the company that made the drug being investigated uh, come out positive. And more than 50%, where it's funded not by the drug the company that made the drug, but by another pharmaceutical company, more than half of those come out, whereas the ones that aren't funded by the pharmaceutical industry, only about 30% find favorable outcomes for the drug, which suggests to a lot of people, well, 
there is a real problem of being influenced by these kinds of material conflicts of interest. And so the solution for a couple decades has been disclosure. There's clear evidence that disclosure does not work. I, I take a pretty uh, rigorous line on that, that there should be, in terms of material conflicts of interest, like owning stock, like receiving money, there should be none, full stop. That any reporter for the report on business uh, or for the Wall Street Journal uh, should not own stock in any of the uh, companies that they might be covering. And if they do, then they're disqualified from reporting on that. Why? Uh, because of this kind of subtle influence that when you're in this kind of relationship where you have in the same way that the uh, journalist you were talking about whose son is in the Israeli army, no matter how much you try to persuade yourself that you're not going to be influenced by that, you are. Yes, to me that's a no-brainer. That's right. So that, it seems to me, disclosure does not, so I read all the time in the, in the Globe where somebody's talking about stocks you might buy and then at the end they disclose, well, I own this stock and so that stock or I bought this one, you know, and I'm glad they've disclosed. But you never know whether the fact they even wrote about that stock in the first place had to do with. Plus, so, it automatically now, let's go to let's go it. from the, the distinction that Ivor made and I tried to make between material conflicts of interest, like owning stock, like having money, and so on, to uh, intellectual ones, where I have uh, contributed money to the Liberal Party, or I've gone to a pro-choice rally. Um, I don't, I don't frankly think that that's appropriate. There's not a dependent relationship there. There's not a dependency. So there's not an obligation to disqualify yourself from doing, covering those things, because it's not a dependent relation. Um, finally... The question was not about disqualification, it was about disclosure, and if I, I can just push back for a minute. Okay. Is it... I, I'm not quite sure I'm seeing how it's consistent to say we can't expect everybody to be neutral, everybody has opinions, we all have, you know, thoughts, biases, if you want to call them that, or whatever. And then, say, on the other hand, those don't need to be shared with the audience um, for two reasons. Number one, I would argue that it helps the audience assess um, what you're doing, and if you're doing it uh, well, um, it's, it's not going to make that much difference, but it, it is going to um, improve your credibility. And number two, if you don't do it and somebody else finds out about it and, and makes an issue of it that way, um, you know, you're, you're, uh, it, it's likely to negate the effect of uh, um, the reporting that you've actually done. So I'm not sure that we can you know, just dismiss it quite that easily. I'm not sure we can, you know, especially if we're going to take the position from the outset, which I believe is a correct position, um, that people have opinions uh, and, and uh, you know, they participate in society and it's unreasonable to expect uh, total neutrality, total uh, separation from society and total abdication from uh, thought on the part of um, people who do this kind of work. So, Paul, I, I take it you're, you're now not talking about whether people have financial investments in something. Yeah. I mean, I'm arguing where there's financial or those kind of links, you just can't do the story, full stop. Uh, you're talking about disclosure, about whether you have biases, <laughs> ideological orientations. Uh, well, I'm not sure about the former, but for the sake of argument, let's talk about the latter. Okay. Um, you know, there's an old there's an old uh, observation in journalism that journalists should not make themselves the story. Uh, if I were a journalist and I were writing about anything political, my disclosure would probably be longer than the story. Uh, given the complexity of our engagement in issues, the range of issues that may be relevant to a story, I think uh, disclosure does not remedy it. Either the disclosure is so trivial uh, you know, I mean, obviously, if I'm a, uh, a president of a, of a pro-choice organization, I'm writing about choice. That's different than if my sympathies are choice. I mean, I have sympathies for a lot of things. And in any political story, disclosing that in a fulsome sense means writing a bit of a memoir and autobiography that would have to accompany the story. I don't think that's a solution. I'd like to call closure on this particular question and see if there's anyone else in the room that would like to raise, make a comment or raise a question. 
Anybody? Yes, sir. Um, so can you wait for Ange to get to you with the mic, please? Uh, I'm wondering what you think of, I guess, endorsements, editorial board endorsements for elections or election candidates, if you think it's outdated or if you think it's necessary and if you think it harms the paper or uh, helps the paper at all. I hate them and I wish we'd stop. It's just the, that Globe editorial where, well, you should support the tor party but not the guy. Like I, what, That was just laid bare how utterly stupid they are now. It made, it made sense 100 years ago when the publisher was a big you know, wheeler and dealer in the community. I guess it made sense then. I'm trying to, maybe, I don't know, you guys tell me. I don't, I hate them. I think it's, I think it's an antiquated, backwards way of doing things. It impacts the journalists who are trying to actually do good journalism. They get branded with being, you know, go, oh, you're with that right wing rag, or you're that Harper loving rag, oh, you Trudeau, you know what I mean? It, I, I can't stand them and I wish it would stop. I don't see what value they have. I don't think they attract new readers. I think it's an old ego tripping kind of thing. It's a bit of an ego trip thing where, you know, whoever it is, Philip Crawley or John Hondrick, really think that people are hanging on their seat to hear who they're going to endorse when it's not really very surprising. And I. Rarely surprising. I guess, oh, really? The, the star endorsed Trudeau. What a shock. But it, <laughs> anyway, I hate them and I wish they'd stop. That's my. Anybody else want to address this on the panel? I'm good with that. Part. Good with that. Other questions in the room? Anybody else? Okay, we're going to start to wrap it up. And what I'd like to suggest is in wrapping up, each member of the panel take a minute to say something that they'd like to say, and it's interesting. I'll start with Ivor. Okay. Well, um, I would like to suggest that, that, well, I think it might be helpful to close with what, what I think we can agree on. It's clear that we disagree on some things, but they're actually relatively minor things. Um, what I would suggest we can agree on is that journalists are citizens of a country and they are, do not check their democratic rights at the door when they take on a job. And that includes, of course, the right to express themselves both in what they say and in what they do. Um, the second is that um, the key thing about journalistic discipline is the method, not the uh, opinion that is expressed. In other words, uh, the, the method of looking for evidence and conveying evidence is far more important than the insight or the opinion or the intellectual sort of slant that the journalist brings. I think we probably could all agree on that. The only problem that arises is the degree, to, there, there are two problems that arise. If one is very heavily invested in one particular outcome, and I don't just mean in terms of relational or material, but also in the one's habits of thoughts, then I think the question does arise of disclosure, um, which, which applies. If you believe very strongly one thing, then I actually agree with Paul, you should express it somewhere on your Twitter feed somewhere. Your reader has a right to know that. Why? Because of this very tricky thing, which is the unconscious effects of one's strongly held opinion. Readers have a right to know that you have those strong, strong opinions when you go about collecting and selecting evidence. Um, and that, and, and you know, I'll leave it there. Okay, Leanne. Well, I just want to say that I'm heartened to see so many young faces that are still pursuing journalism as a career. This is not necessarily related to the topic, but journalism matters. And just because newspapers might be in trouble doesn't mean that there's not a need for good journalism and strong content and news, not BuzzFeed listicles and fluff and celebrity news, but actually hard, old-fashioned news. It matters. And as somebody who went here years ago, I'm glad to see so many young people still pursuing it. Don't get too discouraged. Break stories and you'll make it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, try to be neutral. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Jim. <laughs> uh, I think Ivor's right that we agree on much more than we disagree on. Um, I'd like to second Leanne's observation uh, about both happy to see so many young people pursuing journalism, 
uh, and the observation that journalism matters. Arguably, now it matters more than ever. In a world where everyone is overwhelmed with information or pseudo-information coming from a thousand different sources, the work of good professional journalists to sort the bullshit from the fact that approach stories in a rigorous way is of vital public interest. And regardless of how journalists are viewed by the public, the public's dependence on good journalism uh, is greater than ever, which is why that basic charter right of freedom of the press is, is more important than ever. Having said all of that, I also want to agree with Ivor's observation that where you have very distinct habits of thought, I think that's a nice phrase, your reader has a right to know that. I guess what I was, I think the way the reader can know that is if the kind of limits that were put on Bernie at CBC and are put on everybody else at CBC were lifted, and you were a partisan with regard to choice or anything else, then your reader could know it because you tweet about it, you'd write about it, you could be seen in the public about it. I don't think it's solved. What I, the only disagreement I was having with Paul is, is that solved by having a line, uh, uh, a disclosure line in the story. I think allowing journalists to be full, engaged citizens and expressing their views uh, is in fact a protection for the public. So when they read a story, they do know where the person, they know they have an opportunity to know something about the person. Finally, I want to end with something we disagree on. Um, Ivor, when I, when I suggested April's analogy between the police and journalists wasn't appropriate, Ivor noted that uh, journalists have a lot of power. Uh, I think he used the wrong term. Journalists have a lot of influence. And hopefully, in an ideal world, they'd have even more influence than they have because of the rigor and professional standards they meet. They don't have power. The police have power. The police can do things to you. Journalists can try to persuade you to do things, but it's up to you to choose, and I think that's a fundamental difference. You're right. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Jim, you wanted to yes. say a few things here. I just um, want to now put on my hat for the Center of Free Expression, first of all, to thank April Lindgren and the Ryerson Journalism Research Center for co-sponsoring this event. I especially want to thank uh, my co-panelists, uh, Ivor Shapiro and Leanne Goodman, and our moderator, uh, Bernie Looked. I'm honored to be in the company of such distinguished journalists. Um, and I also want to thank Ange Holmes, the coordinator for the center, who d had to do all of the background invisible work to make this possible, uh, and also to Jacqueline um, Mika in the School of Journalism, who also assisted in, in making this all possible. And finally, thank all of you for coming. Uh, I take it, looking at what I assume to be the age and current work of, of most of you, your students, uh, these are vital issues for you to be concerned about. I hope this uh, panel discussion will help uh, in your consideration of these matters that will shape your future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.